bit, 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 bit about Mr. Ben Johnson's contribution to the growth of English literary criticism uh, in our previous video. And uh, in relation to it, we saw a little bit about the critic and his works, especially his poet Aster, Conversations with Raman, Timber or Discoveries Made Upon Men and Matters. Our main concern, though we, there are references from Conversations as well in poet Aster a little bit, our main concern is uh, with discoveries. Um, and we spoke a little bit about his neoclassicism, is how he was the first neoclassic critic in English, and uh, how he developed his theory and uh, his practice on the basis of the achievement of the great Greek Neoclassicism. And we also spoke many about, uh, a little bit about uh, his classicism and. Uh, when his book, The Timber, or Discoveries in Men and Matter, was published. And also how um, his writings are nothing more than a collection of notes. And, uh, and, and we never know whether he intended to publish them at all or not. So it was posthumously published and contained over 137 sections. We looked into a little bit of his classicism as to how he revered the classics and the, that is the Greek and Latin or Roman writers and cons uh, considering his uh, inclination towards the classical rules we saw a little bit about uh, what exactly he found uh, you know wrong with English literature he basically thought that the English literature, uh, that the English writers had ungoverned impulse uh, and it needed well tried laws to curb it. And what laws did he, um, does he prescribe? He speaks of Aristotle's unities, the unity of action or the dimensions of play, the magnitude of play, and wholeness, wholeness, considering how a a work ought to be whole as in complete. Now today we would look into what his criteria is for the for a good poet. What should be the qualification of a poet? Right, you need to be qualified for everything, right? So a doctor has to have certain uh, a certain education, certain practice, certain, certain training to be a good practitioner, right? Or this so goes for the engineer or the teacher or whoever it is. Everyone needs a certain kind of tra training, certain kind of study or learning. So, speaking of poet poetry, uh, first, he uh, he uh, seems to echo Aristotle and the Greek writers, uh, saying that a poet is a feigner. That is, feigner as an imitator. Feigner basically has a very negative. A connotation today as in someone who feigns is someone who pretends someone who acts but here a feigner simply means an imitator someone who imitates so a poet is supposed to be a feigner and poetry itself would be an art of feigning how best to imitate right there are actors there are actors who simply just read out the dialogues it's, uh, they are so uh, i mean you couldn't properly call them actors they are very terrible actors if you could call them that um but basically an actor has to get into the role right if i as a person am trying to imitate um a, or i'm trying to act the part of a of an old woman okay uh i'm a middle-aged woman myself if i'm you know made to act a part of an old woman I have to look into all the um, uh, all the gestures or uh, mannerisms of uh, of an old woman, right? Only then will I be able to imitate it well. And I have to practice voice modulation. I, ha I would have to practice the speech, the dialogue itself. I'd have to, you know, um, uh, practice posturing, posturing as in. Or change the way I stand or walk or hunch or you know basically 
Painting doesn't come naturally to most people. Some of them are born painters. Some are some of them are born actors, right? But some of them need to learn. So he he believes that a poet is a painter, someone who imitates. And poetry itself is an art of painting. Art of painting is an art of imitation that needs to be learned. And poem itself is the thing feigned. Poem itself is a thing feigned, as in it is the thing that is imitated. So a poem does not exist in vacuum. It has to be. It is just an imitation of something else, and it is the end and fruit of poet's labor. End and fruit of poet's labor, as in, what is the purpose of a poet? What is the job of a poet? What is the ambition of a poet? It is to create a poem. Okay, poesy is the queen of arts, which had her original from heaven, received thence from the Hebrews, and had in prime estimation with the Greeks. Sorry, it's supposed to be Greeks. I made a spelling mistake once again. Forgive me. Transmitted to the Latins and all nations that profess civility. So poesy is a queen of arts. Poesy is a queen of arts, as in there are all forms of arts, right? There is all form. There are all forms of artisan. There is music. There is dance. There is painting, sculpting. There are various arts, but poetry, um, Ben Johnson believes, is a queen of arts. Okay, it's, he he has made it uh, look feminine. Okay, and uh, and which had an original from heaven. Original as in origin. Where did it originate? From the heavens itself, received thence from the Hebrews, received thence from the Hebrews. Here he is making a reference to the Bible itself, the Gospel, right? Where did it come from? It it came from the heavens, and where was it received? It was received by the Hebrews, and in prime estimation with the Greeks, as in it had its prime estimation with the Greeks, as in the the Greeks followed uh, followed suit and created their own poetry and transmitted to the Latins and all nations that profess civility, as in. All the entire civilization, any any part of the world that was civilized, they took up the job of making poetry. All right. So uh, he he allotes a great dignity to to the uh, to the practice of writing poetry itself. See any um, any uh, um, uh, work. Or oh, not work exactly. We couldn't call it work. Any book of faith, any book of any faith, if you consider, you would find that they they've all been written written in verse forms, right? They all are in poetic form. Then speaking of a good poet, okay? What the qualifications of we are discussing the qualifications of a good poet as far as Ben Johnson is concerned, right? So speaking of the qualification of good poet, he uh, states certain requirements. He says these are the few requirements that a, any poet should have to to create good poetry. All right, what are they? Nature, exercise, imitation, study, art. They in themselves, these these ideas themselves are very simple in nature and uh, easy to understand. But the way he is presented is really beautiful. Speaking of the requirements of a good poet, uh, first off, he speaks of nature. First off, as in this is this is in the order Ben Johnson stated it. He gave the most preference. It is from like top to bottom. So the 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 requirement of an, a gifted nature is what uh, he believed was a prime requirement of a good poet. Arts and precepts avail nothing. Arts and precepts, as in arts themselves or rules themselves, avail nothing, as in they they don't uh, achieve anything or cannot achieve anything. Except nature be beneficial and aiding, unless unless and until nature can be beneficial and aid, as in help. Arts, the idea of arts itself or or the understanding of rules themselves, is not going to help anyone so if i am not naturally gifted so no matter how much i learn no matter how much i practice or learn the rules i will not be able to create good poetry we are speaking of basically arts here 
and therefore these things are no more written to a dull disposition than rules of husbandry to a barren soil rules of husbandry to a barren soil as in see imagine if the soil itself is barren you need to have fertile soil to have proper or or uh, um or, or to have anything grow in it right if if the soil itself is barren what point would there be for you to know the workings of agriculture right no matter how many rules you are familiar with no matter how many degrees you get on in a certain thing if the soil itself is barren there is nothing you can do about it right so he he says that unless nature helps unless nature is beneficial in aiding there is no point in learning the arts or knowing its precepts precepts it here would mean rules hence the first require requirement is of natural wit natural wit as in your natural intelligence whatever intelligence in creating poetry for whereas all other arts consists of doctrine and precepts the poet must be able by nature and instinct to pour out the treasure of his mind so we all have treasures in our mind so how well do we express it depends mainly on the nature our nature and our instinct so if we are instinctively poetic by nature whatever ideas whatever brilliant thoughts that cross our mind would be able to present them spectacularly or else there would be no point in you know learning the rules if uh, if we are not naturally inclined to create good poetry the second rule he speaks of is exercise exercise is in exercise here would mean practice all right so exercise of those parts and frequent exercise of those parts and frequent if his wit will not arrive suddenly at the dignity of the ancients let him not yet fall out with choral or be over hastily in anger but come to it again upon better cogitation try another time with labor the common rhymers pour forth verses such as they are extempore but they never come from them one sense worth the life of a day a rhymer and a poet are two different things it is said of the incomparable virgil that he brought forth his verses like a bear and after formed them with licking indeed things wrote with labor deserve to be so read and will last their age see the whole idea of this one or uh, this is not merely one paragraph as such it's a um, you know it has quite a few different ideas taken from different places has been put together here okay it's a, it's a collage of ideas the main point we need to understand here is that you need to exercise yourself if if you want to be a good poet you need to think practice think practice the more you practice and the more you think you would be able to create the kind of poetry that that would stand the test of time see you need to exercise of those parts and frequent frequent what you, what do you need to frequent frequent as in frequently visit frequently read and think if his wit will not arrive suddenly at the dignity of the ancients as in if i do not understand the ancient or the see how many of us can are um, totally comfortable reading chaucer or or uh, shakespeare's original texts we need it to be paraphrased many of us need to be paraphrased but if you try a little harder what you would find is it is really interesting and worth its while because ultimately the satisfaction you glean uh, you know glean from um from uh, reading the original text is far better than anything that you would fry, find from the paraphrased version right so you see he is uh, saying something very similar to it you need to apply to the ancients as in you need to uh, read the ancients as much as you can ancients please do remember we are talking about all those uh, uh, you know greek and roman writers before uh, say 3rd century So third century BC, as in Homer or you know Aeschylus or Aristotle, Plato. We're talking about all of these people. Ovid, yeah. So these ancients, you need to visit them, frequent them as much as you can. Frequent as in frequent would be 
uh, reading them. Okay, frequently read them as much as you can and let him not yet fall out. Let him not as in the person who is reading, let him not yet fall out with, fall out with as in, you know, uh, generally if we don't understand something, we just put it aside. Oh no, I, I don't understand this. I'm, I'm not doing it. I put the book away. I throw the book away sometimes, right? I don't throw it, but I'm just uh, giving you an example. <laughs> So uh, we tend to uh, fall out with, fall out with as in having a quarrel, okay? When we, uh, when we, when you and your friend don't agree with each other, you fall out, uh, you know, you have a fallout, falling out, okay? So if you cannot agree with the ancients, if you cannot agree with the rules or the phraseology they use or, or the, the uh, or the, uh, or the devices, the poetic devices they employ, if you are not comfortable with it, it is all right, okay? Don't yet have a falling out with or quarrel or be over hastily in anger. Don't get angry about it. Don't just, uh, you know, anger, you know, if you give it some patience, don't be hasty in your anger as in give it some time, give it some patience, but come to it again upon better cogitation. As in you go back to it, go back to reading that particular ancient work when you are when you are in a better frame of mind okay when you are more relaxed go back to it try another time with labor labor here would imply hard work okay try once again by working hard about it the common rhymers pour forth verses all right so See, we are not merely talking about reading the ancients. We are also talking about following the ancients. Okay. The diligence with which they wrote, try to maintain that diligence or try to practice that kind of diligence. All right. So he says common rhymers as in the poets who simply rhyme. There are all sorts of poetry, right? There's just jingles that just rhyme and don't make any sense. There are poems that you may call them poems poetry to some extent but still they do not give you any deep meaning or profound satisfaction but and, and there are there is poetry that uh, totally steals your breath R like uh one such poetry for me is rabbi bin ezra by robert browning i know browning was not very uh, um, popular among his peers but uh, well uh, forget the man read the poetry it's really good Okay, so, so, so there are common rhymers who pour forth verses who simply just, you know, uh, just uh, wobble verses as such, such as they are extempore. Extempore would mean on the spot, whatever comes to their mind, they will pull out verses from anyone. Again, it is a talent. No doubt it is a talent. They can do it only because they are talented, they're naturally gifted. But the trouble with those people is that they are not practicing enough. If they applied the rules and practiced enough with the natural gift that they have received, they will be able to create wonderful poetry. But they are doing themselves a disservice. All right. So, but there are never, but there never come from them one sense worth the life of a day. Okay. Not even a single sense you would get from their poetry because they are common rhymers. They don't they simply pour forth verses. They don't give you any profound poetry. A rhymer and a poet are two different things. See, a rhymer himself and a poet are two different things. How are they different? Because rhymer simply is worried about the words alone. Right? To him, there should be an equal uh, weight, of, uh, weight of words. He is worried only about the metrical composition of the words of, of his poetry. He is not concerned about, you know, the bringing in uh, deeper meaning. He is not concerned about the practice, the practice of creating good poetry. But whereas a poet is someone entirely different because he has worked hard. He is naturally gifted at the same time. He's already worked hard. It is said of the incomparable Virgil. An incomparable Virgil is in Virgil. Uh, Virgil himself was a. He was an ancient uh, Roman poet, so he. He um, wrote verses like a bear, as in he brought it in crude form and then he, he uh, 
edited them or uh, improved upon them so much that finally they would start resembling good poetry. In these things wrote with labor, I missed out an R here, some typo error, please forgive me. Um, in these things wrote with labor, deserve to be so read and will last their age. As in, anything that has been written with hard work. You know, hard work is always appreciated, right? Even if uh, for the moment it may seem like you're just wasting your time, ultimately hard work shows. It always shows, right? Um, so anything that has been any poetry that has been written with real real thought with with a lot of hard work is bound to be read even after its time even after its time as in um let's let's not worry about shakespeare here because uh shakespeare was naturally gifted and it is also believed that he never struck off anything he wrote so whatever he wrote he just kept it without editing right um so we, we are not taking shakespeare into consideration here at all but the rest of the writers, they always have drafts. They have multiple drafts. They improve upon writing. So uh, this Ben Johnson believes the main uh, one of the, the main qualifications of a good poet is that he would not merely write as it is, but try to improve upon what he has written. He would exercise, exercise of those parts and frequent. Okay. Another, the third requirement of a good poet is imitation. He should be able to imitate well. So we spoke about nature as in how one has to be gifted, gifted um, with the, um, um, you know, naturally gifted to create good poetry. And then how one person, a person has to, a poet has to really exercise himself, practice a lot so as to create good poetry. Then we look at the imitation. Imitation as in how do we imitate well? How can a poet imitate well? A poet is supposed to be a feigner, right? An imitator. So to be able to convert the substance or riches of another poet to his own use, he should be able to convert the substance or riches of another poet to his own use as in. See, um, this is quite an echo of, not echo, but uh, it is an anticipation of T.S. Eliot's idea of tradition and individual talent. At least I believe so. Because see, um, it, it, it is agreed upon by Aristotle and Plato and Horace and all those people that a poet imitates. But I think uh, for the first time, we get to hear that you imitate someone else. Okay? You imitate another poet. So when you imitate another poet, what you're doing is you are not simply plagiarizing, all right? You're not simply plagiarizing, but using the substance used by someone else, making use of a substance used by someone else, and put it to your own use in, in a manner that is far superior to the one you copied from. Okay, copied is not exactly the right word, or you were inspired from. Right? So you should be able to convert the substance as in the main of uh, the essence, the essence or the riches or the things that are most beautiful some in someone else's poetry into your own poetry. You should be able to make it your own, to make choice of one excellent man above the rest and so to follow him till he grow very he. As in to make you, you know, choice of one excellent man here would be one great poet. Because you have a history of poetry behind you, right? So you choose one person. You choose one person you admire the most in, in terms of uh, poetry, writing poetry. And you try to follow him. You try to follow him as in you try to imitate him as much as is possible. Till he grow very he as in the small he into capital he. As in you become someone very similar to the person you idealize. Okay, you try to practice so much that you become that person. You you start writing exactly as that person used to write. Or so like him, or so like him as in at least very similar to his poetry. So if I'm uh, like, uh, say if I'm fond of uh, uh, 
of oh, Milton's poetry, which I'm not actually. I'm sorry, but uh, say if I'm fond of a certain uh, poet's writing, Pope, Pope. Yeah, I'm fond of Alexander Pope's writing, his poetry, and uh, if I want to be a poet, I would hold him above all the other poets, the rest of the poets, right? So if I'm going to hold him superior in that regard, I'm going to practice. Following him, I mean, I'll, I'll try to follow him in the way he used sentences, he in the way he used verses or, or created verses, right? So I would practice so much that ultimately my poetry should start resembling something very close to Pope, okay, Pope's poetry. Not to imitate servilely, or so like him as a copy may be mistaken, mistaken for the principle, as in principle here would be the the original work of Pope. In, in my example, the principle here would be, uh, be Pope's writing and a copy would be my writing. So my writing should be easily mistaken for Pope's writing. All right. So um, I, should, I should practice so much. I should practice imitating him so much. Not to imitate servilely. Servilely here would mean like in servitude. As if I am a slave following a master. Not like that. As Horace said, and catch advices for virtue. Catch advices for virtue as in when you blindly follow someone. Servitude does that to you, right? So if you are a servant to someone, if you follow someone indiscriminately, indiscriminately as in without really considering whether that person is flawed, whether what you're following from that person is right or wrong, when you do that, you are imitating that person servilely. So what Horace said is that we tend to catch vices for virtue. So if we are going to blindly follow someone, we it is quite possible that we what we take for that person's goodness or virtue could be a vice and we may not even be aware of it, right? So we say do not follow anyone servilely, blindly in, in a, like a servitude but to draw forth out of the best and choicest flowers. Yeah, like with a bee, turn all into honey. So uh, he is using the analogy of a bee that goes into the garden. It does not sit on every flower or it does not sit on every plant. It goes to the choicest flower. I don't know. I am not a horticulturist, so I wouldn't, uh, I, I wouldn't really know anything about it. But uh, I've heard people say that the bee doesn't sit indiscriminately over any flower. It needs to have the best of the best. So he says, like a bee, go to the best in the choicest flowers. Okay, choose what is best in the person person's writing you idealize. Okay, and turn all into honey. Use all that you find there, all the good things you find there into honey as in your own product is your own work work it into one relish and sever as in you work it out into making it beautiful taste it taste wonderful okay make our imitation sweet so how should the imitation should be it should not be crude it should not be blindly done it should not be crudely followed it should be done with relish it should be severed severed as in tasted Okay, enjoy the taste of. While you're writing poetry, you should be able to enjoy it. So that's what we are told, right? When you read something, enjoy it. You'll be able to remember it better. When you do some chores, when you do some housework, do it with relish. Enjoy doing it. If you're cleaning, enjoy cleaning. If you're cooking, enjoy it. The food will test, taste better. Right? That's what we are told, right? So he is ben johnson is not saying anything out of the, uh, you know uh, out of the ordinary he is saying something very simple very basic but most people don't follow it so don't treat it as a you know as a drudgery write poetry and enjoy it so your imitation will be sweet your poetry will be sweet observe how the best writers have imitated and follow them look at how the best writers write okay not merely go for substandard works look for the best and follow them follow those writers now coming to the fourth requirement that is of study we've seen the requirement of nature we've seen the requirement of exercise 
is we have uh, seen the requirement of imitation now we are going to look at study how much you need to study see for anything and everything you need to learn right so if you are going to be even a mechanic you need to see you need to see someone at work you need to understand all the workings of of, of uh, whatever vehicle you're going to work on or whatever machine you're going to work on right so you need to study so he says even for a poet it is a basic requirement that he has to learn to he or she has to study a lot an exactness of study and multiplicity of readings multiplicity of reading as in you need to not simply restrict yourself to one kind of reading but have a multiplicity of choices in reading okay multiple choices of reading so read as much as you can be a voracious reader which maketh a full man you know uh, if you're familiar with bacon's essays you must be um, you, you you may able, you may be able to hear an echo of bacon's words as to how reading make it a complete man yeah uh, reading make it a full man and all that not alone enabling him to know the history or argument of a poem or to report it but so to master the matter and style as to show he knows how to handle place or dispose of either with the elegancy when need shall be no you need to read not not simply to enable you to know the history or argument of a poem or and to report it but to master the matter and style so you see there are various approaches of studying or reading right where sometimes you simply skim through your books sometimes you study them sometimes you learn by heart sometimes you research through them right so there there are various forms of reading there are various forms of trying to understand or approaching a certain work so he says that you not merely need to uh read it read it to know the history or the argument of a poem but to and to report it but you need to read to master the matter and style see matter and style is necessary here for you to practice and understand and uh, yeah and and uh, what are you going to do about it but so to master the matter and style as to, as to show he knows how to handle place or dispose of either with elegancy so handle place or dispose of handle as in how to how you handle matter and style where you place matter and style where certain matter is required to be placed where certain style is to be placed and how to dispose of either where there is no requirement of a certain style where there is no requirement of certain style see these three though they may seem common day terms are quite crucial quite important in the sense that see we have a um see there are i i don't know but to use a cooking analogy when you make something when you cook something say for instance you are making a sweet dish or yeah you're making a sweet dish in some sweet some sweets require um probably some some sweets require uh for you to add a little bit of cardamom right and some sweets require cinnamon some tea, some some sweets require both cinnamon and cloves right just because you have all three you don't dump them into every dish you make sometimes you don't need all three right or or you you might be needing something else entirely maybe just some saffron would be fine right so when you are cooking you have the ingredients once you have the ingredients it it is not necessary that you use those in in you know ingredients indiscriminately without really thinking where it is required where it is not needed right so you need to know how to handle it where to place them or to where not to place them dispose of either yeah with elegancy when need shall be with elegancy to make your work elegant whenever required you get my point the main idea is to study the matter and style and to know where and how to use it and when not to use it right now the last part 
the last requirement is of art c he is giving art the last status one may assume that art is the most necessary part right but uh, yeah it is his prerogative we cannot question it so he says it is art only that can lead him to perfection it is art only can lead him to perfection and leave him in their there in possession as planted by her hand this he can learn from Horace and he that taught him Aristotle okay uh, Aristotle was who, who Horace learned from Aristotle or Aristotle I believe so he says it is art that can only lead him to perfection you need to have an artistic bent of mind only then you'll be able to uh, that art would leave you in possession and uh, possession of the perfection of poetry okay the perfect kind of poetry out of many men's perfections in a science he formed still one art so he taught us how we ought to judge rightly of others and what we ought to imitate especially in ourselves but all this is vain without a natural wit and art itself is of necessity and aristotle uh, aristotle himself gave us ideas as to how we can judge others and how we can imitate yeah how we ought to imitate especially in ourselves but all of this is useless without having a natural wit and poetical nature as we discussed earlier natural wit he gives prime importance and a poetical nature is necessary to create good poetry art comes in the last now consider, considering his observations on style what kind of uh, style was existing during his time and which he favored he speaks he remarks on the extravagance of expression in elizabethan jacobian writing extravagance in expression as in the expressions were lofty and sometimes bordered on hyperbole and uh, in the wrong hands they they bordered on uh, they were they were quite uh, you know egregious you know they did they did not really amount to the the the, the content themselves you know the content the the, the the topic itself the the topic itself uh, has to be um, you know dealt in in a relevant manner also there, there has to be a balance balance in the way a certain thing is said and what is said right so the jacobian and the elizabethan writers were extravagant in their expressions and he oh, put in his noble sensory sensoriousness there you know sensoriousness as in wherein uh, the idea to curb this extravagance of expression is brought about he, he feel he felt necessary language owes its life to thought no word should exist for its own sake and a necessity see you know, you know as someone said brevity is the soul of wit you must have heard of it brevity is a soul of wit is in you know the less you speak the less you say the more knowledgeable you seem intelligent people speak far less when i talk a lot okay uh, so the point is that language owes itself to thought owes its life to thought in the sense that language should be created by thought okay it should not exist for its own sake words should not exist for its own sake like anyone who speaks just for the sake of speaking just for making sound you call it bakwas nonsense right so you need to uh, a poet need not use any word that does not say anything that does not have anything to tell all right no a word should exist uh, um, for its own sake it's like an appendage not unnecessary appendage superfluous it most shows the man it most shows the man as in the word the language used shows the man what kind of person it is 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 he sensible is he reasonable if it is a sensible man he would use the kind of words that are necessary to express himself not blindly speak out just for the for the sake of speaking the three he states three necessaries necessaries as in uh, necessities here um first of all to read the best authors observe the best speakers and much exercise of his own style we've already discussed this in terms of study um authors and speakers we've already discussed it 
and also we have uh, spoken about exercising as in practicing right so there are three necessities in uh, um, getting a good style or, in, or developing a good style first of all you need to re read the best authors listen to the best speakers and uh, try to follow them and also finally practice your own style right you may borrow from them but still have your own style individual style never be content with the first word that offers itself not with their first arrangement and composition when you're writing poetry he tells the poet ben johnson tells all the poets when you're writing poetry as you're talented enough you may be able to create a fine verse at one go okay without really giving it too much thought you may come up with a wonderful poetry you know at, at the first instance immediately okay but he says don't be content with it don't be content with it isn't don't be satisfied with what you have written in the first draft repeated revision is necessary and not even and don't even be content with the first arrangement in composition first arrangement in composition as in the first time you compose something don't be happy with it don't be satisfied with it work rework improve try to improve it so much that ultimately you would come up with a masterpiece so don't settle down for less so that is what he is telling here Re ready writing makes not good writing but good writing brings on ready writing so just because you can write readily as in easily it does not mean that you are writing well but good writing brings on ready writing as in when you practice good writing right when you practice good writing as in you when you practice uh, first of all when you write very easily it does not amount to good writing but if you keep writing if you practice a lot you might end up with good writing and when you keep practicing good writing you will be able to write readily you would be able to write fast as well as really well and by well i'm not talking about the handwriting the cursive writing or oh, your hand we are talking about the kind of words that you choose to write poetry the the kind of uh, you know structures syllable structure that you use that you employ in your verses or the kind of uh, um you know thoughts that you project in your poetry this is what we are talking about when we speak of good writing here we're not talking about your handwriting now so this is something i have repeated here so that we can talk about it once again never be content with the first word that offers itself not with the first arrangement and composition repeated revision is required always repeat 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 until you master it ready writing makes not good writing but good writing brings on ready writing so always remember that it applies not only to writing but speech as well uh, generally we have difficulty in speaking speaking especially communicating in english right so most of us give up just because we cannot speak well and there are some of us who just go along with whatever we know so it is all right in the beginning to to go along with uh, whatever crude form of english we know but you cannot stay in the same place you need to improve always keep improving and practice good speech always try to think of good words to use always try to figure out what better way there could possibly be to use in the uh, in instead of the words you generally use when you, you normally use right so just one piece of advice in middle of uh, literary criticism well as it is fit for grown and able writers to stand of themselves and work with their own strength to trust and endeavor by their own well, sorry it's supposed to be own follies i seem to be making a lot of mistakes these days by their own fac uh, faculties so it is fit for once again a mistake here it's supposed to be for f o r for or for the beginner and learner to study others and the best as in as it is fit for grown and able writers the ones who have matured who have learned who have practiced who have understood from their from their experiences from their mistakes who can stand by and of themselves who can stand of themselves and work with their own strength to trust and endeavor by their own faculties because they they are now comfortable with their own strength they know their weaknesses they know their strengths they can begin to trust themselves 
and they know uh, how far they could you know endeavor with their faculties so it is fit for the beginner and learner to study others in the best see someone who has matured as a poet can depend on himself he need not look up to someone else but for a beginner or a, or a learn, you know new learner he has to look up to others custom is the most certain mistress of language as the public stamp makes the current money as in custom here would mean the trend the convention so first of all before you diversify before you of course we all need to maintain our individuality and it should reflect in the kind of work we produce but custom is of prime necessity it is the certain most certain mistress of languages in uh, a language is based upon tradition so you have you cannot flaunt tradition right at the beginning you have to gradually diversify you can gradually move out or or uh, you know um, show your individuality but in the beginning you have to stick to the convention because it has a public stamp makes current money so without the public stamp there is no money no paper would be called money right while ancient words lend a kind of majesty to style they have to be used with due regard to the intelligibility so speaking of what kind of words one should use when writing poetry he says it is okay to write, use ancient words you know or, or words that are a little outdated you can use them but it has to be intelligible okay your idea your uh, aim should be intelligible you don't you should not require an interpreter you know a reader should not read and require an interpreter to a translator to translate your work to them so if you are writing in english any english speaking person should be able to understand it you should use those kind of words the eldest of the present and newest of the past language is the best for both uh, satisfying the test of familiarity see eldest of the present eldest of the present as in the uh, whatever language whatever language as in we are speaking here of english mainly since you are we are talking about english poetry so whatever english we are talking uh, you know is in current use you need to you you can use the eldest of that you know or eldest of that language the current language and the newest of the past language as in the uh, newest of the past language the, the kind of language that was used some two centuries ago you can use the newest newest form of that language because even that will be a little bit in use and uh, will help people and say it would it would not have gone any undergone any major transformation all right you cannot use antiquated words because they have lost their currency now because they they mean entirely different now all right so there are so many words that have you know that have taken up negative connotations that were used positively earlier they have taken uh, negative connotations now for instance pity pity has a negative connotation as as compared to its um, its earlier meaning right so uh, yeah there are there are plenty of such uh, words you have to not merely look at the word itself but how the word is seen today or understood today and would be and would be writer ultimately uh, to sum it all up he says and would be writer will have a taste for choiceness of phrase round and clean choiceness of phrases in the kind of phrase he uses it should be choicest round and clean composition of sentences the sentence should be clean it should not be disruptive or or uh, be incomplete it should be well rounded sweet falling of the clause and each clause should be in its proper place it's as if it has like you know fallen exactly where it should belong okay um varying an illustration by tropes and figures weight of matter varying an illustration by tropes and figures illustrating it with varyingly by tropes by tropes is in by uh, various poetic devices and and figures figures of speech yeah weight of matter the thought itself what kind of matter is being talked about worth of the subject how worthy the subject is soundness of argument what argument is placed and how well it is placed life of invention how well it has been created a writer has to worry about that as well how well he creates it how much life he puts into it and the depth of judgment okay depth of judgment as in he has to show his judgment there a writer has a grave responsibility he cannot simply write in vacuum
thank you so much uh, this is all for today stay safe be happy assalamu alaikum